Okay, great. It's four o'clock, so I'm going to kick off and welcome you all this Wednesday afternoon to our afternoon session, um, which is entitled Artsize Salon from Open Data. Uh, sorry, from donor to open data. My name is Susie O'Hara and I'm the project manager of um, and curator of One Cell at a Time, which is an ambitious and multifaceted program of public engagement events and activities that are happening across the UK in Newcastle upon Tyne, London, Oxford and Cambridge. The Human Cell Atlas, or the HCA as, it, as it's uh, generally known, is an international scientific research initiative that's aiming to map every cell type in the human body. The body has 37 trillion cells or thereabouts, and the HCA is looking to create a, a human Google map, which researchers can zoom into to understand every human cell type across time from development to old age. This work will transform our understanding of biology and disease and could revolutionize the way that illness um, is diagnosed and treated. And this new knowledge on cellular mechanisms will lead to new diagnostics and treatments and transform future healthcare. The Human Cell Atlas was co-founded in 2016 by Dr. Sarah Teichman at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridgeshire here in the UK, and Dr. Aviv Gev, then at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard in the US. It is a truly global initiative, and there's now more than 2,000 HCA members from 75 countries around the world working on this initiative. And so what is one cell at a time? Um, one Cell at a Time is exploring the science of the Human Cell Atlas through art and community-driven projects. The project is led by the Wellcome Sanger Institute and it's funded by the Wellcome Trust to run parallel with the work of a consortia of six UK-based institutions who have collectively been awarded a Wellcome Strategic Support Science Award to conduct and create the first wave of reference maps for a range of different organs and tissue groups, including the gut, the skin and the lungs, among others. The partners include the Wellcome Sanger Institute, EMBL EBI in Cambridge, the University of Cambridge, Newcastle University up here in Newcastle upon Tyne, where I'm based, King's College in London and the University of Oxford. And so the science of the Human Cell Atlas is currently being explored by a multidisciplinary community of clinicians and technologists, physicists, software engineers and mathematicians, as well as biologists. And the One Cell at a Time team expands this ecology of expertise to include artists and creatives and communities. And over the past eight months, we've been exploring key questions that drive the Human Cell Atlas initiative, including what does it mean to be normal? A pertinent question in these times. And it's one that our commissioned artists have been exploring with communities across the UK over the past year from a social and a cultural perspective. However, it is also a fundamental question for the HCA science. The HCA is seeking to create a Google map of healthy human cells, so researchers need to understand what normality looks like in order to be able to identify disease. And over the past week, participants of our virtual Maker Jam have been creatively exploring the complexities of working with tissue and data that's been donated by publics for research purposes. By bringing together art, science and communities in this way and in these different ways from across the United Kingdom and now the world through sessions like this and our Maker Jam, we aim to bring about a cultural shift towards enhanced and sustained engagement with the Human Cell Atlas across research and diverse communities who are going to benefit from the positive impact that this scientific research will potentially um, generate in people's lives. And so I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted um, to welcome our four speakers here with us today. We have data-based artists, Julie Freeman and Daniel Kanager, um, as well as HCA members, Elo Madison from the Welcome Sanger Institute and Wei Keng Tay from EMBL EBI. And I'd like to say a special welcome to Daniel, who's zooming in from, I think it's Valencia. Did you say Valencia? 
<laughs> to be with us today. So thank you so much, Daniel. And so we'll be kicking off the event in just a moment or two, but a few bits of housekeeping to note before we kick off. So it will be lovely and thank you so much to those people who have kept their cameras on. Um, I think it is nice for our speakers to um, see their audience while they're speaking, so I really appreciate that. Please keep your mics muted to reduce any unnecessary noise, unless of course you have a question and if you do maybe use the emotion um, icon um, or drop your question in the chat, we'll pick them up um, at the end of the session in the Q&A session. Do use the chat function, drop your questions, your ideas, any links that you might want to share with the um, audience here today or the speakers. Um, it's always great to have a, a lively chat in these events. Each speaker is going to speak for about 15 minutes um, and we'll, I'll introduce each one before they, they go. And if you do have any questions, do drop them in as, they, as they're speaking and we'll pick them up at the end um, and bring them into the Q&A session at the, end, at the end of all four um, speeches. And so, without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first speaker here today, Wei Keng Tay, who is a data wrangler and a bio oh gosh, a bio I'm not even going to try, a, a person who works with biological data, <laughs> um, who's working in EMBL at the UN Cell Atlas, um, which is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory the Euro at the European bio Bioinformatics Institute. And Wei works to um, obtain scientific data from different labs and publications and transforms them into a standardized and easily accessible format for open use by scientists across the globe for their work in the Human Cell Atlas. This is then used to build these different human cell atlases of the entire body, allowing for the discoveries that we've been seeing emerge from this research project over the last number of years. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to gift the screen to Wei. Thanks, Susie. Uh, I always love your energy. It's so great to be um, in a Zoom call with so many wonderful uh, and excited and energized people. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen and hope that you can all now see um, this presentation. Thumbs up? Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you again, Susie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so as she said, I'm Wei. I'm a bioinformatician and a data angler for the Human Cell Atlas. And I'm going to be talking about, you know, from donor to open data and what it means to sort of wrangle data. I'm going to start with a very brief overview of the aims of the Human Cell Atlas, then talk about what metadata is and its importance, then the value of data from the public and data diversity. Then if we've got a bit of time, I'll talk about you know, data angling in the HCA and open data in particular. So very briefly, as uh, its core mission, the Human Cell Atlas aims at building a comprehensive map of every single cell type. Um, so there's hundreds of different types of cells in the body. They're not only just divided up by you know, skin cells or fat cells and nerve cells, but also more rigorously into you know, cells of specific chemical makeup or what proteins are on the cell surface, what the cell secretes or its purpose. Taking blood cells as a specific example, we've got a huge number of different types of blood cells beyond just you know, platelets and um, blood cells in plasma. Each blood cell type is be specific and focused and more and more are being discovered each day. I believe Elo, who will be speaking next, has in fact discovered you know, some new novel types of lung cells just from her project. Uh, so the Human Cell Atlas attempts to create this comprehensive map showing how each of these specific cell types are different using a bunch of different techniques, but primarily one called single cell RNA sequencing. I won't delve too far into the technical details, but um, it's a commonly said thing that DNA is the blueprint for the cell. It contains all of the information um, and using single cell RNA sequencing, we can tell you know, which part of that information is being used, what genes are being expressed which is a way of saying what DNA is actively being used to produce proteins. So the takeaway basically is that it allows for incredibly precise information on a single cell 
level. And uh, Human Cell Atlas is focused on creating this huge database of all of this information on every single type of cell in the body. And of course, the vast majority of this data comes from you, um, the public, uh, and involves something that we call metadata. So data was that bit that I mentioned earlier, you know, how every single cell it differs slightly in what DNA is being used at any one current moment or like what genes are being expressed. Um, and I focus much more as a data wrangler on metadata. So metadata is data about the data itself. Um, examples would be, you know, the age of a donor who has donated tissue or the blood type or, you know, a protocol on how a sample was extracted or what machine was used to sequence um, this set of DNA. You know, what's the drinking history of this patient? There's loads and loads of different types of metadata. I can't stress how important metadata is to scientists and to science in general. Um, a big thing in science is reliability and repeatability, reusability, and metadata is intrinsically important to that. You know, if you don't know what machine it was sequenced on, or you don't know, you know the age of your patients, then like how are you able to repeat this experiment and show that the results are true? How are you able to, to trust this data that you're getting? So at the Human Cell Atlas, we focus a lot on metadata and making sure it's standardized and making sure that it's available. So this comes neatly into sort of the value of your data. Every single individual's data is different. Everyone lives different lives. Um, your metadata, it concerns anything from you know, where you're born, where you moved to, where you lived in, the pollution in the area that you lived in, what kind of diet you're eating, your drinking, your smoking history. All of these are individual specific things we're trying to understand we envisage you know, with the human cell atlas, we can take this to that specific cellular type level, which I mentioned earlier, you know, questions like how do individuals of a type B plus blood type who lived in this specific county, you know, with a drinking history of three to five units a week, how does that specifically affect, you know, CD34 plus blood cells? What, what, and, and then knowing that, like, what can we then do about it? Um, and that requires, from one sense, from the public, um, this huge availability of metadata. You know, the more we have, the more we can learn and analyze and understand. So if there's anything you take away from my talk, it's that like your data is really valuable. It's really important. And we learn so much about the human body through it. Like, you know, even small things that you think wouldn't be that important, like, you know, what your diet is, uh, or you know, like the place that you were born in, um, and so your data is really important. And in the human cell atlas, what we need and what we're trying to create is this holistic and diverse set of data, which brings me to the point of data diversity. The human cell atlas, you know, um, is a global initiative with lots of different labs around the world, but we do get a strong concentration of data from North America and from Europe. Um, to properly be a cell atlas of all of humanity. You know, we want to get data from all over the world. We want to get data from all sorts of different groups, you know, um, nationalities, ethnicities, geographical locations. It's all like, they all add up to create this like really important clear picture. There's also lots of minority groups that are hugely underrepresented in science. And often these groups are the ones which are more wary of signing up to scientific research. Um, and that's totally understandable, but to create a holistic view of you know what's happening in the body, we definitely want to prioritize data coming from underrepresented population groups. We we need this diversity in data, or we don't. We just don't have a clear enough picture of what's going on. Um, so I'm going to briefly discuss a bit about data wranglers and you know what I sort of do on a, a daily basis to to create this wonderful. So Atlas together with all of the wonderful people I work with. Um, so our mission as a data wrangler is to support data generators sharing their data with the HCA community and to ensure the data shared is fair. Um, so we want people to come and give us their data and make it as easy as possible to share this data with everyone else, but also we want the data to be of a certain standard 
So fair basically means, you know, it's findable, it's accessible, it's interoperable, it's reusable. We want to make sure that the data is useful to other people, basically, because there are so many cases where you have a you know huge Excel document that's you know like thousands of rows long, and you're trying to search through it, and like your computer shuts down, then your computer like you know sets on fire, and like the whole database is gone forever. So we have certain um, a lot of what we do is attempt to create this infrastructure to make sure these terabytes of information that we're getting from all across the world can be useful that people can all, all machines can look through find patterns and that this database can be built on and keep going so from a data wrangling perspective often it'll start with us reaching out to someone who's published a date paper of useful data or another lab will reach to us and say you know can we put the data on the human cell atlas and the great thing about this is that every lab stores their data in a slightly different way um, so some people will send information to us in spreadsheets, some people will send them in Word documents, some people will you know, give us a link like to a Dropbox, and um, a lot of what we do is try and standardize all of this. Um, we use ontologies and standardizations and work with you know, our software developers to develop useful tools to make all of this as useful as possible to other researchers. And it's sort of trying to create clarity and use from this huge massive information. Um, I won't go into ontologies now. Um, I will if I've got a bit of time later or if anyone has any questions and just like ask later. But it's sort of yeah. Um, so we, we try and make sure things such as like you know how do we make sure the different slightly different ways all the lab store information gets standardized. You know how do we make sure the scientists want to filter through on an organ or like a specific blood type like you know, what is important to the scientists to filter through. We're always conversing and trying to get more feedback from them. And importantly, I guess for the purposes of this talk and for the public, like how do we ensure your data is used appropriately in the way that you consented to? Um, and a big part of like the importance of this and making the standard way of representing all of this information is that it helps allow scientists to submit their data to us, but also helps them save time in searching through and discovering new data and comparing and combining different data sets together. Lots of scientists spend a lot of time cleaning and organizing data. I know a lot of PhD friends who you know, like a whole year of their like PhD is just like reading and trying to find useful information and dragging out things from appendices and making tables and trying to get useful things. And we're trying to be able to hopefully cut into um, some of that and allow the scientists to focus on science itself. So as you can imagine, this is sort of what our human cell atlas data portal looks like. You know, we've got millions of cells, we've got over a thousand donors and a hundred projects, and it's a it's a difficult challenge. Um, the scale is big. We want to ensure the data is usable and you know findable and like it's it importantly can be used in all the ways that the public has allowed. And the last thing that I want to talk about briefly is just that sort of concept of, of open data. Um, I hope I've made it clear over the course of the presentation sort of how the availability of metadata, your data is like incredibly valuable to research and to science. Like we have ethics committees that work over ensuring that the data is represented in the right way. There's like loads of papers we don't wrangle directly because we err on the side of like ensuring that people's wishes when it comes to data are respected more than anything. That's the one thing that we take into consideration above all else when wrangling a new data set. You know, it's your concern. So like here at the HCA, we really believe in the positive effects of open data. Like there's been connections made through collaboration and sharing data openly. There has been you know, loads of scientific research that's been done throughout this collaboration. You know, there have been um, researchers that would otherwise never really intersect, you know, a, a kidney cell type resembling a liver cell type that was both found in data sets that we had wrangled and then that sort of connection gets drawn that otherwise wouldn't because that data there is made openly available. And yeah, at the Human Cell Atlas, we really hope to be this, you know, reference source helping to facilitate scientific research and scientists both now and in the future.
and yeah, I just want to you know, acknowledge the different people that we work with. We work with the Broad Institute and the University of California, Santa Cruz, and also our fun, uh, big main funders, uh, the WSSS, and Welcome, and CGI, and of course, you know, Embo EDI, where I work. And yeah, thank you very, very much for listening. That's great. Thank you so much, Wei. We've, we've heard um, be nice. Yeah, absolutely. Big, big, big round of applause. Absolutely. Really fascinating talk. Um, some nice comments in the in the chat already um, about this acronym FAIR. Maybe we can have a touch base about that a little bit later on, but um, really fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Okay. If anybody has any um, any questions, do drop them in in the chat. Meanwhile, I'm really, really pleased to welcome our second speaker, Julie Freeman, to share her screen with us. And while she does, I'll briefly introduce her. So Julie's focus has been the investigation of data as an art material, using it to create work which reflects the human condition through through the analysis and, and representation of live data, data from living systems. She translates complex processes and data from natural sources into kinetic sculptures, physical objects, images, sound compositions, and many more. Questioning the use of data and digital technologies and how we translate nature, whether it's through a swarm of zoomorphic butterflies responding to air pollution levels, a lake of fish composing sounds, or a pair of mobile concrete speakers that lurk in galleries spewing sonic samples. Intrigued? I certainly am. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Judy Freeman. Right, so I'm unmuted. Thanks, Susie, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to um, this salon, uh, it's right up my street and I love hearing from other artists and other scientists. So I'm, I mean, really enjoying it already. And um, way, I particularly love your um, iceberg analogy, but I've been going on about how important metadata is for such a long time. So it's like music to my ears. Um, I've never seen that iceberg thing. And I think it's really true that the data is less important than how you use it and how you describe it. So um, in my practice, defining data as an art material, it's all very much about the metadata. So lovely segue. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how to, about some of my practice, some of my artwork, and then a little as an artist, and then a little bit about the stuff I've been curating um, over the past few years with Hannah Redhors, who's on the call. Hi, Hannah. Um, so yeah, so I, I think one of the things that has, um, really captured me, I guess, is that we're really instrumenting the world through sensors and mass measurement. Everything has become about data and data has become this kind of infrastructure that we're basing, you know, a zillion decisions on every day. And what that means is that it's really important how we describe what methods and languages we use to describe that data. So how we translate the data is really important because it holds so much power. And as the world, becomes described by data. Um, I think that we need to consider, you know, using it as artists, as, as an art material, as well as using it for um, other reasons. So I'm particularly interested in data as um, looking at real time living data. So data from natural systems, from, from things that are alive. And I think it is fair to say now, I used to be more questioning of this idea, is data as an art material? Is it an art material? But actually, I think it definitely is. And it is because it's malleable, it is manipulatable, you can use it in many different ways. And I think that's a valid uh, definition. Um, so yeah, it is an art material. So I'm going to talk about um, RAT Systems, which is a project that's part of my PhD research. And it is, um, it's a really, I think it's an interesting example for this group of people and this um, project, because it uses data in a number of ways. And I wanted to get a, a real-time data feed from some animals. And I met um, a biologist who has, is a keeper of naked mole rats. Naked mole rats are the most amazing critters. And here's a picture of one kind of asleep in its den. 
It's one of my favorite pictures. And they're very small. They're only maybe 10 centimeters maximum long. And they're naked. They've got no hair apart from a few whiskers. And they've got loads of amazing qualities. You can, I mean, I'd recommend looking them up. I could spend the whole talk talking about them. Um, but they're resistant to cancer and they've got incredible longevity. So for a small animal, they last 10 times longer than a mouse would. So for those reasons, they're really widely studied in biology because they're qualities that humans uh, are interested in adopting. So what we did was we set up um, a digital tracking system. So the one thing about uh, data is that I was interested in how Chris, the biologist, was tracking and understanding the behavior of these animals already. And he said, we sit in a room and we monitor, we look at the mole rats and we watch them and we mark on a form what they're doing, what activities they're doing and where they're going. And then the naked mole rat room is 30 degrees centigrade. So it's really hot and humid in there. And so the researchers can only spend a certain amount of time and they get fatigued. They can only do it certain times of the day because they can't get into the animal labs in the middle of the night. So for him, me setting up a digital system to track them 24 seven was really valuable. And he was excited to be able to get new um, big data, if you like, um, about his animals to understand what they were doing. So the first thing we did, we set this up. It ran, the data collection ran for about four years. Um, and we got about 30 million lines of data in the end, which is totally unwieldy, but um, we kept it anyway and we're doing stuff with it. And one of the things we first did was analyze it in a very kind of, you know, traditional sort of scientific way. We ran it through, this is a program called Tableau, which is good for um, manipulating and visualizing data. And we found one of the interesting things we found was this really dramatic drop at this point in, in one of the hours, over a couple of hours in one day. And when we looked, it was the time when the adult, there's one breeding female as part of the colony. There's 24 in this colony. And it was when she was giving birth. So at parturition, not just, she didn't just stop and give birth. Every other member of the colony, their activity slowed down and they pretty much stayed where they were in the nest while the, the babies were born. And then the activity picked up again. So it's this big kind of like dramatic drop. So it's really fascinating. And so for, for Chris, he'd never seen anything like this. And this is new, you know, this is kind of like brand new research outcomes that have, that have emerged from the project. So although it's an art project and scientific outcomes already being proving to be quite significant. Um, but once we've got the data, so this is great and it's interesting for me, but I wanted to use it as an art material and to, to, to help me understand the data a bit better, we set up um, a fairly traditional data visualization, which is something that I could log into online on the website and look at where the animals were. So we just denoted the males, the females and the queen. And this is like an animated, very simplified version of the nest that they live in. And what this did was allow us to monitor very easily which hours of the day there were a lot of activity, which were less activity. We could look at things like um, territories where some of the animals were kind of spending more time and there's heat maps and stuff on the, on the website that do that. So that was interesting because when you're gonna work with data as an army material, subvert that data, it's good to know kind of what it's about and what patterns might be within it. So then I started thinking about, well, if this is, um, how, can we, how can we translate this data? How can we use it in a way that is interesting to an audience? So for a naked mole rat, we know that they're alive. Um, there's many of them. They're also individuals, they have an individual behavior. They do seem to develop patterns um, and they've got some predictability that we, we managed to analyze. They change as well. So they change in hierarchy. When the new ones were born, some mole rats changed their patterns depending on where the babies um, started to patrol. And then obviously they die. We didn't have any deaths, fortunately. Um, and so then I looked at mapping those kind of qualities to an object. If I was gonna make a sculpture, how could I map those qualities? So if it's alive, that means there's some sort of movement, for instance. If there's patterns, is there some kind of synchronicity in the movement of the sculpture? And then to think about how that then maps to an audience. So what do they see? If they see a moving kinetic object, they perceive that as energy. The energy comes from the animal because the animal is alive. 
So this is just like um, some of my thought processes really about how um, I wanted to make a piece of work and what I was hoping that it would mean to an audience. The thing that interests me specifically in this was some of this idea around pattern um, and movement and synchronicity. And if an audience is watching something, they begin to recognize a familiar movement, recognize um, a repeated movement, then it becomes familiar to them. And then they experience the work in a sort of different way. There's this kind of relationship that starts building. And then I think that's when the work becomes um, more successful in a way, because it's really engaging. So the works, some of the works that came out with this, a piece called, I call This Is Nature Now. And these are um, some soft robotic silicon sculptures, little kinetic sculptures. And they've been driven by real time data from the, from the mole rats that I've mapped in particular ways to make these kind of dance like movements. And this, I mean, honestly, soft robotics is a whole field of research in itself. It's unbelievably fascinating, very complicated. Um, and one of the things that I loved about it is that these sculptures are completely silent. So I wanted to create things that A, didn't look like an, an animal because I wanted the movement to be the, the, the priority and B, something that was silent. If you um, create kinetic objects that have a lot of motors and stuff inside them, you tend to make a link between the movement and the sound that could be um, not necessarily what is coming from the data. So that doesn't always work. So it's important to me that these are as quiet as possible. And I did some research on people as they were looking at the artwork and we found that they did feel like they seem to be alive. And they also commented that they seem to have a relationship between them, even though that wasn't true. And so I think it was just the, the motion that was, you know, catalyzing that kind of response in the audience. Another piece of work that uses the same data in a completely different way, and this is a this is this sort of work is something that is very much part of my practice, the abstract representation um, of data moving around. And I wanted to just convey the essence of the data, the speed and the flow, the kind of uh, velocity, the veracity, if you like, as well. Um, and in this piece of work, we represented different elements of behavior and then tethered, you can just see these kind of, I don't know if you can see my cursor, the sort of, we tethered the males and females together to see if there was any clumping going on, if they tended to do things, um, sort of a gender split. And one of the things that this animation does, although it's not didactic, it's not, it uses data visualization techniques, but it's something that is very much a sort of subjective use of the data. What it does that if we see some patterns in here, it allows us to then think, well, maybe that is happening and we can go back to the data, analyze it in a sort of a proper statistical method and find out whether that's true or not. So it's a kind of ambient way of monitoring what is happening with the data. And there's a soundscape that, that goes with this and you can see it, um, on the website, I don't, I didn't embed a, a video, I'm afraid. And then another piece of work, again, using the same data, but this is in the more, rather than directly using the real-time data, this is a, a sort of conceptual use of data. And I've discovered that um, animal data privacy is something that people aren't considering. And I thought it was quite important to highlight that we need to be careful about the privacy of our animals. I found out that if you go on safari in a country within Africa, for instance, and you take a picture of an elephant and you post it on social media and the metadata is posted with that picture, then collectors and poachers are scanning social media for these images, finding out exactly where the animals are, and then go in and either taking their horns, if it's a rhino or killing them or, or worse. So what social media people, social media users were inadvertently doing was pointing poachers to the animals. They were tracking them. Um, and this, I found this really sh quite shocking. So I was like, okay, we're really, we're quite aware of our own privacy, but we really need to think about the flora and fauna that is around us and how we need to protect that um, from the kind of metadata that gets attached to it. 
And even in um, scientific papers, when there's been new discoveries of tiny orchids, for instance, some of the researchers have stopped saying exactly where they found that stuff because collectors were going and locating it. So it's become a real, um, it's become a real issue. So I thought that this was good to make a piece of work out of it. It also gave us the opportunity to take portraits of all 24 animals, which you can see are full of character. And I've put the redacted um, marking over their eyes. So obviously you, you can't identify who is who. <laughs> it's a very, um, and it's printed big. It's a very striking piece of work. So although you can see that it's one stream of data, these are for very different treatments of that data and have very different kind of ideas behind them in what they were trying to convey as artworks. And the other thing that is <clears throat> interesting about work like this is that it can be displayed in an art gallery. So this is a fact in Liverpool and you can see the work is, is displayed in a really kind of, uh, you know, an art gallery style, but then also the work was displayed at New Scientist Live where we had something that was much more interactive and we talked about how everything was made and we had the animals. So it works for a scientific audience as well as an art audience. And for me, that's really, when, when it's really successful, that it, you know, it kind of, it, it almost blurs these two perceived separate disciplines into one. And it's just about how you talk about stuff. So, and it's a big collaboration, that one, with a lot of people. They're the four main collaborators, and you can have a look at the website. So I'll just skip on to some more curatorial work, and this is with the Open Data Institute. So when the Open Data Institute started, about getting on for 10 years ago now, um, they decided, or we decided, that they should have an art programme to highlight the idea that as well as data being used for commercial or academic purposes, it can also be used for um, cultural purposes. So Data as Culture was born and it uses, we've had over a hundred artists now through the programme and they all work in very different ways. And one of the things they do need <clears throat> is data to be made available. So um, what Wei was just talking about there um, with, with his FAIR criteria, that's really important to artists so that they can access data and use it because it's in, in you know, a reasonable format and so on. So I thought I'd just whiz through different ways that artists have used it. So this is a print, this is a piece of work that is um, a binary printout of all the data of um, a group of artists who lost their funding. So their group folded and then no one was paying for the server, no one was paying to host their work anymore. And they were like, what can we do with it? So they created this beautifully bound series of books that were designed to last a thousand years. And it questioned this idea of the, the, the permanence of data and what will last longer and how things will be translated in the future. The vending machine is a piece of work by Ellie Harrison. It's literally a crisp machine in the office and it dispenses crisps when there's bad news. So she's, it's um, data as nutrition. Um, Yoha created a piece of work called Invisible Wares where Bristol City Councillor's data, their expenses data, was fed into this pneumatic stool so the councillors could sit and ride their own data, <laughs> which is a tangible way of, of seeing the difference in what expenses people are, being, are claiming for. Um, we've got Dan Hepp making bio art and painting where he stored some of the encrypted key to dis decipher this painting in a tag that's embedded in his hand. So unless you are near Dan and he'll let you access it with um, uh, an NFC enabled phone, you'll never be able to decrypt what he's written in these paintings. Um, the piece in the middle is a merge of, of the British, uh, of the London transport, London Underground map and the geographic map of London, you can see that one has affected the other and it's about fake data in a way and how we see the world based on the symbols and the way that data is represented around us. Natasha made a curtain of 3000 um, wedding rings that she found in pawn shops in, in um, areas around the UK. And this is kind of a very tangible thing that you can walk through. And it kind of highlights areas of deprivation 
where divorce is higher. So it's a, a very poetic sort of data visualization. And then as music, that's a piece of work I've made of musical compositions from scientific data. Um, it was used as performance by Thick Ear and they did um, a piece of performance in the office where they were um, collecting data and putting it on a sheet in triplicate and then the end performance was people could pay to redact other people's data. Um, and then Fabio <clears throat> Latanzi Antonori makes data that is, makes a sculpture that is a really beautiful light work which flickers different sort of shades of light. And when you wonder what's causing the flickering, um, you realize that he's linked it to crimes against humanity from all over the world. So although it's this very beautiful, very kind of, or, you know, pseudo religious looking piece, it's actually about the fact that we're pretty horrible to each other. So just as a sort of, that's a, like a real summary, there's loads of works on the, on the website that you can have a look at. And as part of the site, we um, have used this idea of labeling data correctly. So Wei, again, you'll be really pleased that we've asked people to drill down into the data that they're using in their artwork and define it. Is it personal data? Is it metadata? Is it geospatial data? Is it anonymized? You know, is it environmental data? And I think that by defining data in a more granular way, we begin to understand it better. And we also begin to convey a bit more clearly what the work is about and, and, um, and how it can be perceived. And that's, you can search the artworks by the different data types as well on the, on the website. Am I right for time, uh, Susie? Yeah, maybe another minute. Okay, I'll just quickly then just sneak it in. So We Need Us is a piece of work that um, uses data from a website called the Zooniverse. And the Zooniverse is a citizen science website that, you, that scientists are allowed to, they can put up their projects and they ask people to analyze their data. And it could be sound data, image data, um, all sorts of stuff. And so I wanted to make a work out of the metadata that defines all that and sort of look at how people are powering science. And one of the interesting things is that a lot of the data that's up there can't be analyzed by artificial intelligence systems. It still needs this human input. And I loved the idea that humans were really still important. Um, and so each of the types of data, uh, each of the different types of project are create one of these sound and animated compositions. And there's about 15 of them on the website. At the moment. And what this does is just shows that, you know, you can look at the activity of people who are analyzing data. So it's very meta, it's like a lot of artwork about metadata. And it's really kind of quite contemplative and absorbing. It's one of my favourite pieces of work. So there you go, high speed. I told you there's too many slides. But, um, thanks very much. That's a little overview of my work. And um, yeah, looking forward to hearing from the rest of you. Thanks very much for listening. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. Just so much, so much to consider um, in in that talk, Julie. I'm, I'm I'm really hoping that we get some really great questions in the chat. I myself have numerous questions if we don't. So um, really interested in this notion of context of where this work is shown, and I think it should be it should be kind of noted that actually the ODI, the Open Data Institute, Hannah and Julie use the office space as their site for exhibiting these artworks that she showed you, um, which I think, again, is just, just a really intriguing approach to how you can situate these ideas in different contexts and the impact of that in terms of other work and other knowledge generation. So really fabulous. Thank you so much. Really brilliant. So our third speaker today, without further ado, is Elo Madison, um, a scientist in 
So welcome Gina and Campus um, with the task of studying the diversity of cells in the human body. She's also a stand-up comedian and performs science-themed stand-up comedy in Cambridge pubs and online, which is an intriguing fact. She's working on the Human Cell Atlas and this has placed her in an interdisciplinary environment between single cell studies and computational biology. And her fascination has always been in genetics and combining large data sets for describing biology. And in recent years, she's been building a cell atlas of the human lungs and airwaves, discovering new types of cells, which is amazing, and figuring out their function. So I shall give the screen to you, Elo. Thank you, Susie. Uh, I imagine you can see my screen. If there are any problems, please let me know. Uh, like Susie said, hello, I'm Cher with the Sanger Institute and European Bioinformatics Institute. And I've been working with analyzing the human lungs and airways from the donor data. Uh, what we get for uh, as a material to study are chunks of the human lung from organ donors. So these people um, have died for uh, reasons unrelated to the lung. And for some reason, the lung transplants were not uh, accepted for transplant. So we, um, then the families have consented for the usage of this material for research. And that's the origin of our lung material that we consider as healthy as possible that we can use. Uh, out of these lungs, we get uh, material from different locations, the trachea, which is the airway, and then the bronchi sections, with the, including the airway, uh, smaller and the bigger, and the trachea was the biggest. And then what we call parenchyma is the, the outer area of the lung where the oxygen exchange actually happens, where we get oxygen into the blood. And now from these uh, chunks of tissue, we do analysis in the lab. Uh, this is done by the wet lab team uh, with single cell RNA sequencing, which allows us to build these cell atlases and finding new cell types and looking at their uh, genes that they're using. And then another method is spatial transcriptomics. So you take the, the tissue, you section it into very, very thin sections, you put it on the slide, and then you look at the uh, gene usage on the slide uh, and on the dots. I will go through that. So let's go heavy into single cell RNA sequencing. What is that? What do we get from it? In single cell RNA sequencing, you have the single cells from the chunk of tissue you made single cells. And these, every column has one single cell. This is actual data from a project that I had analyzed. And in this case, cells, they could be any number from one to biggest data sets are millions these days, but that data set had, um, uh, it was about uh, a thousand cells or so. Every column is one cell. And the data we get for every one of these cells is on the left column, which is the number of genes. These are gene names. Genes have multiple different names. This is terms one type of identifier that you could use. And then let's say about 20,000, 20, 30,000, depending on, um, on how, you, how you define them and how you decide to keep these genes in analysis. But we have a lot of these genes. And this is the data matrix that, that we work with, that we start. And what can you see from this? You can see the numbers. And the numbers reflect on in that cell is using that gene. So they get a number. The bigger number it is, the more it's using it. It doesn't exactly uh, equal to that this cell has that many molecules of RNA coming from that gene, but it, it's sort of uh, uh, considered an equivalent uh, for, for the usage of interpretation. What you can see, for example, I have highlighted now in pink, the cells that have one similarity is that gene in here. They all have high numbers for that gene. So the saying that these cells that I have highlighted, they are using that gene. Hence, we're saying that these cells are similar to each other. They're more similar than to the other cells in this data. Another example, the, the ones in yellow, is that gene here where this is number 13, this is number 10. It's a smaller number, but these two cells appear similar because they're using that gene. And there's now there's 20,000, so we can look at combinations as well. This is too much to analyze by eye. So uh, there are people specialized working, uh, they're specialized in working to figure out these mathematical tools that would combine these cells for us. So in, case, in my case, when I'm doing the analysis, that means clicking the buttons because somebody else has mathematically uh, find methods to combine these cells for me and for interpretation for others. And that brings us to the favorite part of my work, which is the main part of the work, 
where, uh, which I will show you in the live demo. And uh, live demos, they always work well, right? So here they are. Every dot here is a cell. These computational algorithms that I told you about, they, they put those cells from this table into here. And the cells that are similar to each other, that were using similar genes with similar numbers, they group more closer to each other. So the cells that are closer, the dots that are closer to each other are similar cell types. They're similar to each other. They make these sort of groups of cell types. Now, in this case, I have already annotated them. I have called them different names. I'm gonna open it up so you can see there's plenty of different cell types that I have in here. 81, 82, this is a basal membrane example. We can see the B cells, the, the plasma cells, they would light up in here. There's a lot of cell types. This is all from human lungs. I mentioned we have different regions. So in that case, let's see, this is here, location, true. In different, this is from trachea, from bronchi, from the parenchyma. You can see different uh, uh, cells light up. So, but, but I start with data like this, that there's you know, no color and I get to assign a cell type. So how do you assign a cell type? You just have the cells that are grouped together and you look at these shapes essentially for the whole day. So for that, each of these dots have information about those 20,000 genes that I was telling you about. So let's look up some of them. I, I know a lung specific gene, SFTPC. This is expressed in lung epithelial cells. And that gene, here you go. The more blue it is, the more higher it's expressed. You can see it's the, uh, in here is the cell type that is using that gene. And this is very important in the lung for the oxygen exchange. And that cell type will have to be mature for the baby to born. Premature babies don't have that cell type uh, fully functioning. And that means they cannot breathe properly on their own. They cannot make the oxygen exchange happen. And they actually, they, they collapse. It's a surfactant to uh, keep the lungs firm in a way. Um, I'll just make the cell <clears throat> just bigger. Another, uh, let's say immune cells, PPPRC. I, I just know these genes because I've been looking at them. In the beginning, when you start to work with that, you spend a lot of time in Google. You're going, what is an immune cell marker? And then you look through all of them. So in that case, immune cells. Immune cells is a whole new world, uh, a whole world on its own. And lung is a barrier organ. You keep breathing in stuff particles, microbes. So the lung has to be ready to react immediately. It has a rich immune system. For example, let's see IgHA. This is um, immunoglobulin that is being used by the plasma cells. So you can see these are the plasma cells here, which I have annotated as, as such. And they produce IgA antibodies, which, uh, which are marking these foreign particles in the lung so that the other immune cells could eat them up because they are foreign bodies and they shouldn't be in, in the lung in the first place. And that, there's uh, plenty of cell types. And I wanted to get to the point of showing that in this data, there's a lot of different donors that we have used. And now these, for donors, it's like, these are all the cells coming from that donor and they're colored by cell type. You might notice that there are slight differences, like this donor has a lot of this purple cell type. That donor has a lot of this light green there. Here is another green. So there are huge differences between the donors. And if we had sampled, let's say only that donor, we would say that that's the cell type composition of the human lungs. We just have a lot of this, this cell type here, which is pink. But that would have been misleading because all the others show that this is not the case. That was just a case of that donor or a case of a technical detail in the lab on that day. And that, that's, uh, that's a fun part for me to find, to find and describe all the cell types. I'll try to get back to my presentation. And it's loading for me. And I hope you can see that too. The second part of the data that we get is this spatial trans transectomics. And then here, every dot is, it's uh, between one and 50 cells. So you have this very thin slices of tissue this is an airway section in here in the light is where the air moves in. And this is the epithelia covering it, going deeper into the tissue. You can see areas of cartilage around. But when you zoom in, then these dots, you can see are covering multiple cells. The darker it is, it's a cell nuclei. So each nuclei has a cell around it. So you can see a multiple different cells are covered in each dot. And for each dot, instead of a cell, we get this information about the 20,000 genes. So every dot has that information table. I get a table with all these dots 
and then the genes corresponding to the dots, which rep represent up to 50 cells, which might not be the same cell type. But then um, combining those two, we have this single cell data and this spatial data. We can then uh, ask the cell, the dots to be, can we please light up the dots that would show that has the same uh, gene pattern as this ciliated cell type, for example, which we know should be in the epithelia just surrounding the, uh, the air lumen space, and it does. The cartilage has chondrocytes, so the areas of cartilage, which we would see if, if that image was any better, but it's not, we can see this chondrocyte um, cell type lighting up as we expect. Alveolar type 2 cell was the one important for the uh, surfactant molecule. This is the lighting up in the area where uh, it's a bit, bit seen where the oxygen exchange happens. So it's all what we expect to see, but that also allows us to map new cell type. And that brings me to my favorite new discovery of the past month, where uh, we have mapped the cell types into the tissue. This is an airway section in all of them and different cell types for each of those panels. For example, here is B plasma cell. This is a, a plasma cell that is secreting the IgA, um, uh, IgA antibodies, uh, immunoglobulins. So here they light up in that area. The B plasma cells light up in that. And other B cells, they don't light up in that area. And what is in this area? So that area is where we have the uh, SMG submucosal gland mucus cells, they light up here, the duct cells of the SMG, the submucosal glands, and the zero cells of the submucosal glands. So these cell types also map in here. And we know they're supposed to be here because on histology, when we look at the image, this is where the glands is. That's exciting to find a cell type co-localizing co -localizing in the structure. A second thing what we see is this uh, new fibroblast that, um, that I found in the data, a very small cell type, but this is also uh, co-localizing. It's the same place the cell type is lighting up as the other ones. And that's, this is a very interesting novel finding. This is newly described cell type, new location information for that cell type, all in one go, all in the same experiment. Uh, set up. And the B plasma cell, known cell type, but new localization for the human airways. And that brings us to the uh, whole biological insight where we conclude the survival niche so that the immune cells, the B plasma cells are uh, being retained and kept uh, alive long term in the submucosal gland. These are important for asthma, for chronic uh, uh, bronchitis and var various diseases. And we, we have further proof looking at specifically which genes they are, but I think this is uh, taking this all together. Um, and now coming back to the donors and how they're different. I mentioned that the donor will have different proportions. In here, this is six donors from the lung and the colors, as you see, they're different between the donors. And the, uh, here it's specifically the immune cells shown and you can see difference between the donors. On the right hand side, it's, uh, uh, you can see the donors on the, the right bottom with the A different donors and then the location with given on, on the left side of the plot. And immune cells are distributed for myeloid cells and lymphoid cells. So the myeloid are the ones that are quickly, quickly react in the case of infection. And the other cells, the lymphoid cells, T and NK, are the ones which will take days to kick in. So they will be trained by the uh, cell when they encounter a, a virus, for example. And then a few days, the immune cell immune response is very specific and that takes longer to take into account. And the dots, the size and the color both re reflect as, as more enriched or less enriched in, in that specific donor compared to the others. And you can see that the myeloid ones, the ones that are always present to react immediately when you need, they don't have that much effect from to donor. They're sort of equally between the donors, but the specific type of immune cells that are very specific, slow, and correspond to infections, they are very specific to a donor. And that is expected because a donor, that donor might have just had a specific infection a few weeks ago and the other donor didn't have that. But for the purpose, we also need a lot of information from many different donors to, to make conclusions about how, what is normal and what is not. And I'd like to finish up with showing you some of these uh, plots when I do look at the cells because I do that a lot. So for example, in here is a nice representation of different fibroblasts that I have plotted. This is a big fibroblast cell type and they're in the smaller ones and it's colored by the location. Um, can anyone say what does it, that remind you of? 
it's not a difficult question. I'm not sure I can see a chat. Oh, poor print. I did see a chat. Yes, that's what I thought too. Sometimes I look at these images, I'm like, I'm at the string and I'm just looking at ink blots. Like, is it fine? Am I seeing a paw print or it's that, is that an explosive? Like, what is it? So next one. Uh, I feel embarrassed I was asking because I think it's so obvious that these B cells with IgA on the right side and IgG on the left side, it's actually a nice heart just looking at me. Uh, no, that might be a more difficult one. I looked at it as like, this is interesting, but what does that remind me of? So what does that remind you of? You can put in the chat, jellyfish. <laughs> I thought the same. <laughs> I was looking at this like, these are tentacles from a, a sea monster. And that, that sea monster apparently is a jellyfish. And jellyfish, they can be quite monstrous. They can really be, looks like a hop. I don't really actually know what a hop is. Have to get back to that. <laughs> Okay, so let's do another one. Uh, the one on the left side. That on the left side. It's, it's kidneys. I wish I had thought of that. Pepper. Pepper? Huh. Yes, a butterfly. <laughs> I see a butterfly. Bell pepper, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it does. So the one in the middle, any, any takes on that? So the left side was fibroblast and muscle cells and these very few rare, rare cell types that we find. Two otters looking at each other. Yes, they are. They absolutely are. <laughs> uh, embryo, I guess that goes for the right or for the middle? Prawn, both. <laughs> oh, both. Okay, both look like embryos. Yeah, I, I can see that. To be honest, these ones on the right, they're exact the same data. This is from oesophagus and the big bunch of cells, these are epithelial cells because there's a lot of thick epithelia in the oesophagus because you swallow things and you need a thick protection so it wouldn't get anything in your tissue. I don't know, people swallow stuff like forks. I don't know. Uh, have, I just have kids, they swallow everything. So you need big proportion of epithelia. And these small scribbles here is everything else. Like you have immune cells, three of them, you have some fibroblast and some muscle cells, and they are the ones that are standing out from the but exactly the same data, two different mathematical methods of processing them. Weird, so I, I also always try a lot of different ones. So um, no more uh, options in the middle. So on my good days, I look at it and think, this is a smiley face. <laughs> on my bad days, I like it. Maybe it's this, it's an angry face looking at me, but right now, right now, let's say it's a smiley face. And the last one we got then offer for embryo. For me, it looks like almost a footprint. But I did my PhD in embryology, so I do also accept embryo as an answer. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a fun part of my, of my work. I put aside these funny looking plots whenever I get them. And with that, I say thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, a lot of people have to acknowledge for this work. There's a wet lab team that literally did with a special analysis. And uh, PI Kirsten uh, Mayer and other people have contributed to this project. And again, thank you everyone for. Uh, for listening. Fantastic. That was really great. Really enjoyed that, Elo. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We're getting lots of um, clapping hand icons here. Um, really fantastic. Brilliant. And so our final speaker today is Daniel Kanager. Really pleased and absolutely delighted to, to welcome you here, Daniel, um, to give you a little bit of time to share your screen and set your presentation up. I'll do a little biog for you. Um, so memory materiality and the ceaseless ebb and flow of information of da uh, as data are central themes in Daniel's work. And in 2020, the Spanish National Cancer Research Centre paired Daniel with Sarah Teichman, who is Gene Expression Genomics Group leader, I believe ELO's boss, <laughs> um, and also co-founder of the Human Cell Atlas, um, to work together and explore creative responses to the data and the open data that is generated by the Human Cell Atlas. And so <clears throat> I'm very excited to hear a little bit more um, about this work, which was, I think, very, very recently launched. Um, so over to you, Daniel. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you so much, Susie. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's good to be here. Um, 
I'm assuming everybody sees my presentation. Thank you. So I'll jump right in. Let me get my timer going. Um, basically, um, I, uh, as an artist, I don't have a scientific background at all. Um, I have a artistic background. And one of my uh, obsessions in the last few years has been uh, transforming notions of the archive from material based media to store information and knowledge to cloud based uh, and I, I would say rather intangible media uh, that, um, you know, is what we're using right now to store information. The, this transformation, which has basically happened in the last two decades, has uh, had profound changes in the way we um, store knowledge and information, the way we circulate it, the way we have contact with, with, uh, with information, with data, I guess we would call it today. Um, in this sense, I'm very interested in excess and very interested in waste and confronting material versus uh, intangible as I was saying, intangible cloud-based archives. So I wanted to start with this, this uh, you know, libraries, which are spaces that I that I love, and unfortunately, are being replaced by by Google and by YouTube and by many other online um, sites that we we use. I find it kind of interesting that this fabulously uh, elegant library that was built in in China. Uh, I was just really struck by it architecturally. Um, later was revealed that a lot of the books were made of cardboard. They were just props. And that in itself became an interesting uh, message for me that books are, are kind of coming in many ways interior decoration, which says a lot about, about kind of the, the obsolescence of material based media. As an artist, I'm really trying to understand this transition from Gutenberg to maybe the DVD. We have, uh, we have covered a long historical arc that has come to an end. The arc of material-based media, as I'm, as I'm explaining, uh, that is basically something that we can hold, that we can touch, that we can um, manipulate, that we can store and retrieve in a very physical way. We are, I think, animals of the physical, of the tangible to understand in many ways is usually meant to touch and to feel. So the challenges that are brought about by this transition, I think are phenomenal. This is, this is a, a recent art project I did. It's an homage, a, a goodbye and send off to DVDs. I collected 2,400 films from garbage and dumpsters and waste. Just basically the DVD is garbage. Uh, I'm a real uh, dumpster diver and garbage junkie. Uh, you do not want to come to my studio anytime soon because it's uh, nuts, the amount of stuff that I accumulate. Um, it's an audiovisual um, artistic experience, projection based, where I viewed the 2,400 films that were on the, on the press into the DVDs. I selected fragments from each one of these films and projected them onto the surface of the DVDs. So you get this very kind of experiential um, experience with 12 soundtracks. Uh, you can see more details of, of this uh, art project on my web on my website, danielcanogar.com. In any case, um, it is this kind of not only saying goodbye to DVDs, but it's saying goodbye to material based archives. Part of the artwork uh, of this project I just uh, showed you was presenting the 2,400 empty plastic DVD cases, almost like the DNA of the artwork, um, which again, even the way they're presented here reminds us of libraries, of archives, of, well, let's say it finally, of an atlas. So this is kind of my entry point to data, is trying to think, visualize, wrap my mind around these new uh, liquid-like very excessive archives that are constantly mutating or constantly changing. And I've approached this world of big data from multiple uh, perspectives. This is a work called Ripple, 
uh, which is exploring uh, the 24 seven news cycles of online news uh, sites. So it's connected to places like the CNN and BBC, Al Jazeera, uh, Euronews. And when a news item on video format gets uploaded to, the, to these news sites, I grab it and download it into my artwork. As that recently, um, that recent breaking news introduces my artwork, it descends a screen and leaves a trace behind. The net result is this very kind of hypnotic abstraction, very uh, abstraction, sorry, that is constantly being replenished by the news of the moment. And where you get that kind of hodgepodge, fragmented, crazy mixture of news from the terrorist act to some banal viral video of a cat or, or a cooking class or a sports event. But again, the net result is this very kind of abstract, very painterly, very textile-like um, abstraction that is really taking the pulse of the news of the moment. Here we have another artwork that's called Aqueous. And this is a permanent installation in Silicon Valley for a foundation that the clients wanted an artwork that responded to the technological innovation of the area. And so this is basically using that uh, crazy big archive of uh, 4, 000, 4 billion videos on YouTube. YouTube is my palette to create this artwork. It's inter an interactive artwork where uh, visitors can create their own artwork using YouTube queries. So there is a little uh, iPad kiosk, uh, a little kiosk with an iPad on, on the side where you can enter a search, whatever it is, whatever you want. In this case, I introduced volcanoes. So the artwork will go to YouTube. It will download the first 100 videos that appear under that query and create this very liquid-like abstraction. Depending on what the search is, if you do Charlie Chaplin films, you're gonna get this very kind of elegant black and white abstraction. If you do Beyonce videos, you're gonna get something very kind of poppy and fast fired. Uh, this was the Real Madrid soccer team. You're gonna get a lot of greens from the, from the playing field. Um, again, it's trying to make sense of, of this kind of excessive amount of data, of information that is, um, you know, kind of available to us online. And then came Sarah. <laughs> and then came uh, the, the Cancer Center, the National Center of Oncological Research in Madrid, where every year they pair an artist with a scientist. I had no idea of, uh, of what the research of the Human Cell Atlas or, or Sarah Teichman's uh, research. Uh, we had some initial um, Zoom calls where she very generously explained me the, the project. And of course, I, my, I just was just kind of blown away by it. Um, speaking of excess uh, data, this was just far beyond anything I'd ever thought about before. Uh, the, the big data of living systems, the algorithm of life is another way of trying to figure out how, how to sort it out. So it was very, very humbling, uh, and that was also an intimidating process, though Sarah was incredibly patient with me and walked me through the, the basics, again, because I do not have a, a scientific background at all. It was really starting from scratch. Um, I, I started looking at uh, the aesthetics of cellular representation. And this, for me, was kind of a, an interesting exercise, just thinking, for example, of the dyes, which yeah, the dyes that are applied to, to the different tissues um, and how they have these beautiful aesthetic um, kind of visualizations. I've always asked myself, are there any aesthetic um, decisions um, uh, you know, at work when, when these dyes are applied? And I always think that human beings in general do have a need, whether scientists, artists, or, or whatever, you, we do have a, a kind of this compulsive need to to bring beauty and aesthetics and organize things in a visually engaging and beautiful way, no matter what you do. But it, it was the spatial transcriptomics uh, here that you, this kind of partially covered, Let's see if I can move this, so, um, that really got my attention because this was not coming to my territory. Dot matrices, 
uh, LED screens. I work a lot with screens, the, the, the diodes of LED screens. This really got my attention, this kind of distribution of, 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 of tissue uh, through, through the matrix of, of these dots. This was for me the entry point into, into what now became my, my human cell atlas project called Fulgurations. Um, so yes, so when I started looking at, at, at these, um, these graphics, uh, um, which you know, we just saw in the previous presentation, some really good explanations of how, of how, how they're actually convey the information to, to further the, the atlas. This became very interesting to me because they reminded me of my LED tiles and I'll show you an example shortly. My, I, 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 um, I work with um, quite a cross-disciplinary team. Um, my studio has engineers and it has programmers and it has architects, architects, art historians. Um, I mean, it sounds like it's a massive team. We're, we're nine in total. But um, this kind of mixture of uh, technology and art and history is a, a very kind of fabulous um, you know, mixture of people that, that, that are working, working uh, in my studio. And one, one of the things that I uh, became immediately interested in thinking about excess and thinking about archives was this concept of an atlas, the contradiction of doing an atlas of something that is so not only excessive, but constantly mutating and in, and in perpetual transformation. It's like that old saying of it's impossible to cross the same river two times. It is almost like trying to create an atlas of, of, of you know, something that is just, you know, a living system that, that cannot at any time just be kind of bound in, in a, in a in a, in a book, in a tome, in a, in a volume. So um, that became a very interesting also entry point for me, just thinking about these new kind of living archives. Uh, I've been greatly influenced by Zygmunt Bauman's uh, thinking about liquid modernity, this kind of software modernity, as opposed to the hardware industrial modernity of the past, where this kind of flowing liquid-like systems really captures uh, the essence of, of this constant state of flux where everything is constantly mutating that is so characteristic of the internet and of the constant circulation of data. So just thinking about cells and cellular behavior is something that just happens at so many levels of society from, you know, the mysterious coordination of hundreds of pedestrians walking along Fifth Avenue and that miraculously don't bump into each other to the kind of self-organizing flocking distribution that you would find in a, in a beehive. These were all elements that I started kind of seeing all around me, including of course, uh, living and suffering uh, the age of coronavirus where suddenly um, it's just become like this, a, a very transformative way of looking at life with this kind of invasive viral a presence that is kind of um, uh, latched onto to humans and kind of uh, turned us into prey. So all this kind of uh, started coming together with these 3D mockups, um, where I wanted to create a sense of volumes of, of books of a almost like a book stand, where instead of actual books, you have the, the, the pages have been replaced by LED screens, which is one of my main tools that I work with as an artist. I have a lot of, I've developed myself, we've developed a lot of uh, different kinds of LED screens, including flexible sc screens that allows us to do, to think of screens as sculpture. Um, this detail here became kind of cables connecting the different uh, books, the different uh, visual books, where the data and electric um, power is, is um, kind of goes from one element to another. Um, certain references to some some post minimalist artists like Donald Judd and other light and space uh, artists. It became very important also to me to kind of think of these uh, books as becoming screens uh, that constantly mutates and constantly change. Um, 
and also the, the, the potential rhythm, the code, almost like a barcode, it could be um, used in this different spacing of the different, um, the different kind of uh, metal boxes that, uh, that have the LED screens and all the uh, computer and the uh, power supply units and the receiving cards and the sending cards, all this technology that's kind of hidden within the sculpture. Here are my first messy prototypes. Again, I, 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 it's interesting, this is in, in my studio in Madrid, uh, where you have the, the data cables and the electric cables kind of trying to put it all together. Really also thinking of the cabling as not only having a technical function, but also a sculptural presence. It makes me think of eBooks and Kindles and all these other kind of connected devices that have transformed our way of reading, our way of, um, yeah, of, of, of you know, transmitting and uh, accessing data and information, our tablets, our iPads, et cetera, et cetera. And then we started working on the animation that would be conveyed on the LED screens. Again, you can see here the parallel with spatial transcriptomic representations of cells uh, of high, uh, the, the beehives, and just uh, just kind of using this, um, you know, basic a game of Conway's game of life model, the the cellular automata, and um, uh, uh, can you know very initial these initial um, connections between algorithms and cellular behavior become obviously very apparent in, in the project, and in fact. Uh, as an artist that started out with photography and then moved on to video and is now working with generative art. This is an algorithmic generative project. It is constantly mutating. It has a life of its own. I almost feel that now that the artwork is finished, you get close to it. It's almost like looking at, for example, an ant hill where you see all the ants busily in action doing their things that they know how to do. And that we can only really look at it as spectators and, and only begin to devise the, the plotting actions that are that are happening. We don't really know what uh, my, my algorithmic cellular activity is hap happening or doing, but there is transmission of data from one element, from one book to another. There is uh, ideas of, of contaminations, fulgurations, expansions, contraptions, um, and, and it's 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 a living system. It's a living system based on the instead of the genetic switches that go on and off, the, it's the algorithmic switches that have been uh, coded uh, to start with. A very important element, of course, of the artwork is not just what you see on the screens, but what happens in the spaces in between. Uh, those spaces in between um, communicates in a way that's kind of, um, I think, kind of poetic, uh, where you may get a, some blue on one tile and some red on the on the other tile, uh, and the other LED tile, and you get this kind of purpley in between uh, 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 hue in the middle. Um, I'm very influenced by light and space artists uh, from the West Coast. I actually have a studio in Los Angeles. I have a studio in Madrid and a studio in Los Angeles, and both places have kind of had a, a big impact in, in the way I, I, I think of, of uh, art and, and how, I, how I create. So the, the final work is called Fulgurations, which of course has that sense of a fulguration of light, but it also has that medical use of a fulguration as this exposing, uh, using uh, light to disintegrate uh, growth tumors um, and, and I kind of like this kind of medical association. The work um, is kind of um, the opposite of interactive. It interacts with itself. It doesn't interact with the public. It is um, constantly changing. Uh, of course, it's uh, important. I wish you could see it live. I was just finally able to, to um, unveil this to the public uh, a couple of days ago, last Monday. Uh, to the National uh, Center for Oncological Studies and their actual headquarters. So it's being presented in, in this kind of research center and a lot of uh, employees and researchers that work in the center are now kind of taking a look at this work and maybe being kind of puzzled by it, I don't know. Um, I have a, sh a video where you can kind of see it, see it in action. 
So yeah, this is my attempt to look at the, the big data of, of living systems, uh, to think of cells as something that um, is replicates in, at many levels. The, fa the fascinating fact that algorithmically speaking, when we program in the studio, we are in a way um, kind of doing a biological 2.0 uh, coding and, and there's a I find it very kind of fascinating that we are echoing the living systems in the way we're we're presently programming uh, this mirroring of nature in technology is something that um, I'm just only beginning to discover which I think uh, is is a very kind of fascinating um, uh, thing to ponder and and mostly um wondering why why did that happen is it just an uh, an accident of you know technological research and development or is there something perhaps more mysterious more poetic this kind of inner mantra i would call it of how things that we build inevitably mimic and echo uh you know the, the living natural system that we all come from so that's it for the moment. Um, uh, I, I'll pass the screen back to Susie. Thank you very much for your for your attention. Sick. Really brilliant, really fascinating, really wonderful to see your final outcome, Daniel. Thank you. Um, excellent. Yeah, lots of lots of hands clapping. I, I totally concur. Totally concur. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm conscious. I'm conscious of time, and I, I'm sorry, but we may have to go over just a little bit in order to take one or two questions, um, if anybody has them. Um, we've had a few um, kind of comments in the in the chat, which I'll pick up. Uh, I'm just looking at the otter comment here. Um, so I think there was a a, com a comment by. Pete, who was asking about Julie's work right, with the soft sculptures earlier on, Julie, um, what did they, what kind of movements, I believe the question was, did they stretch as well as wobble and rotate was the question. Hannah came back to say she didn't think they did, but we have you here, so we shall ask you directly. Yeah, they do, they, they work with, um, there's three, sort of air tubes inside so they can they can extend and compress and then they can move like they have a 360 degree um, movement as well so they can curve right round and then round or up at, yeah up and down as well so they can I mean they're very they're weirdly quite phallic I gave a talk to the women's institute and they were all giggling <laughs> Um, I didn't want to say anything there to be no, fair to you. Get it out now. But <laughs> um, an interesting use of kind of, you know, this this manipulation of, of space and objects when it came to movement and data. And I thought it was really interesting in terms of how you thought about um, what you would omit and what you would, you know, in order to kind of foreground an aspect, you kind of thought through what you would kind of, you know, leave out, do you know what I mean? So representation, for example, um, you know, and this notion of kind of, you know, the hearing the mechanics would make, would foster connections in people's minds around, you know, that, that maybe you didn't want necessarily to happen. And I think that's really interesting when you think more broadly about data and the connections that you know can be inadvertently or kind of consciously made by in, in the way that it's displayed and the way that it's presented. Yeah, but there's so, there's so much in it because there's so many that they yeah there's there's just so many different aspects to any big data set like that that you have to sort of weasel it down to what you want. With, with the kinetic sculptures, we looked at pretty much solely looked at their predictability. So we looked at, we used Markov chain modeling to discover whether or not some of the animals had more of a predictable route, which is kind of like their memory, you know, and it's it's not that some are more clever than others, but that there was a, some did tend to um, do the same patterns, go through the same space again and again, and we could work that out and the younger ones didn't. So what happened, with those dancing objects is that the queen had a much more uh, sort of exotic dance because it had more movements because the queen 
did lots of different things and then repeated them. Whereas the younger ones that were mapped to, the, to some of the smaller objects, they tended to be a bit more repetitive. So you could see this kind of emergent behavior of the animals coming out, depending on where they were in the hierarchy and how, how much sort of memory they had of their own nest. So it's kind of, that was very much about one particular type of analysis on the data. Really interesting, really interesting. Um, I'm quite just that I just wanted to make sure that I touch everything on the on the chat. And um, Daniel, there was a question, I think, from from Pete asking about your uh, one of your pieces. Uh, I can't remember, Pete, you might have to remind me of which piece you are asking the question about in terms of whether the content that was being streamed. Oh, I think it was from the news channels and um, what you call it. Was that an ever growing? database or was that a kind of a kind of an archive in itself that you were creating um the work so the, the, that piece is called ripple and it archives the last thousand uh, news items the news clips um as new ones come in the older ones get bumped off so uh we could we could could, could have could easily continued to archive all that uh, all that information but in, in a way, the work is about the ephemerality of it all. How, you know, in literally what you see on the screen gets covered by the news, uh, the new news that uh, you know comes down and, and erases the previous one. It's really much thinking about this uh, twenty four seven news cycles. You know, uh, when I grew up, it was very much about buying the newspaper and the the you know the newspaper stand in the morning and then watching the the news and the evening news. And there's these very kind of definite. Uh, rituals uh, with very specific time when would consume news, but this kind of twenty four seven, and this kind of fear missing out syndrome where we're constantly addicted and kind of uh, you know glued to our screens, just <clears throat> unable to kind of peel our eyes away from whatever thing has happened in the world. This is what the work is about. So it's not so much about uh, about archiving. It's very much about the flow about this constant um, flow uh, that quite frankly, amongst other things, is very much about this amnesiac present where we just have the stimuli of the moment, but are unable to kind of archive uh, in terms of our memory in our memory banks, whether biological or, or technological. This is one of the big challenges I find of big data is um, how uh, we kind of tend to lose ourselves in, in the excessive amount of, of uh, knowledge and information and data. How do we organize that? How do we, how do we create memories? That's a great question. Julie, I see that your hand is raised. Can I, can I ask a question? It's actually, Daniel, uh, what you said at the end of your talk, it was really interesting. It's great to see your work. Thank and you. um, Likewise. Thank you. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, that the idea that um, I think you were referring to some of the sort of artificial life techniques that we've been using in computer software, sort of generative technologies, but it, it reminded me of um, a book called Technobiophilia, which is written by Sue Thomas. And she talks about this, like if you think about computing terms, we use the word bug things are called Python, the more you look into it, the more you see that nature has totally sculpted the language of um, computing technology. And the book is really fascinating. I was like, oh my God, the pennies like really dropped. Because I think some of the early, some of the really early computing, the tiny rule-based systems um, were all based on, um, kind of inspired on this idea of how the cells work this kind of one little thing affects something affects something and then it's just kind of like ramped up in complexity but i think you're right that that is super interesting how we um weave nature that sort of mimetic nature of of uh, how we think computer programming so i just wondered if you've got something on the horizon next that that looks more deeply at that uh, yes, I do, but um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to disclose it because of uh, I, I've signed an NDA. But it's definitely a new entry point for me of, of research. Um, uh, you know, I've looked at financial data, I've looked at you know news data, I've looked at uh, um, online 
uh, online shopping is another big piece I did uh, some couple of years ago. So this is just opening a, a new, a new book, a new chapter, a new uh, pathway for me that is probably the most interesting that I've come upon so far. And and this kind of this kind of techno biophilia, which I'm going to totally check that out like like tonight. Um, I think that. Um, in a way, technology has become is becoming a new form of biology, and I guess, of course, that's directly linked to a life. And um, but but I, I think it, it it's it's it is kind of a deeper, almost I would almost call it like a mystical um, incorporation of of biology within within technological systems. That I think it's it's, and and maybe this has something to do with me practicing transcendental meditation um, and it's kind of transformed my view of things but how this is kind of mantric rhythm in technology and a lot of my artworks have that kind of hypnotic repetitions rhythms it sounds like taking the pulse of of something that is so apparently so chaotic and so vast yet perhaps has this inner rhythm that is is kind of the heartbeats the kind of heartbeats that we would find in in living systems so I'm very, I'm very interested in, 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 the, in these, in these uh, ideas. I'm really, I'm really intrigued to, to maybe hear from Elo or Wei in terms of these, these notions of, of pattern making and the way in which I suppose, um, you know, data, because actually the relationship between um, biology, data and technology in the human cell atlas is very it's very intimate actually um and they speak to each other and have evolved a language i'm really interested if this kind of um this nature-based language has kind of followed through as the complexities that the hca is dealing with in terms of in terms of biology and technology has that has that continued and um just yeah just getting your thoughts on on this relationship between data technology and the and maybe the complexities, some of the challenges that um, you guys face. I know you talked about donors and the kind of need for more diverse donors um, uh, in order to be able to kind of give a more holistic understanding of uh, the kinds of cellular um, pictures and stories we were generating through this research. Giving you lots there, loads to lead on. <laughs> no particular question. Yeah, um, I'm still very fan of these where the cells are dots and then they become together and make shapes, uh, especially because when after doing so much of the lung, whenever I see another data set from the lung, I look at the shape of the cells and I'm like, this is that cell type and that's probably that cell type because I sort of have learned the sizes and the, uh, the um, neighborhoods of the shapes to each other. And some cell types are a bit connected. Others are completely separate, small ones, big ones, and they are close to another set. So although it looks completely different, it's a different shape. It's like every time you run this analysis, it's a different shape, but now the, the overall, how they relate to each other, the areas and the sizes there, they're so similar, which I find is, is, is actually so fascinating. And if you take another tissue, it has the immune cells are always shared. And then you have some sort of fibroblast, some sort of epithelia. You, you can start almost guessing at another organ cell type composition as well. I find that really interesting. I, I have no arts background. I think it's all fascinating, but that, that's the only thing that I can see when we talk about patterns. That this is in my, like inside my eyeballs. I look at these patterns always and a lot of people show different patterns. So that's exciting for me. The individual patterns of people, they're fascinating. Way. Yeah, um, on my end, um, I, I allow the coding and the machines to do a lot of, more of the, the pattern generation, the pattern detection. Um, mine's much more like taking data from disparate places and trying to sort of like slot them together into something that fits and can standardize and can be filtered through. So with the, with the idea of like technologies and how technology is constantly evolving, I'm not aware of any HC specific jargon that's you know, particularly biological, um, but um, we do constantly have this rush of like always 
being on the lookout for the next new technology and trying to sort of get ahead of that to develop our schema to be able to handle that. Um, and so there's this, there's, there's always this feeling of like needing to be up to date with current affairs and like future affairs. And, and based on, on Julie's question as well on, on whether gender, we gender the, the segregate, segregate the cell data, we definitely do whenever we have that metadata and we also sort of like make that a priority to get that metadata and to also represent that as well as we can. So for example, we have a data set which is, um, has testes um, samples and some of those testes samples are from people who are trans. So we want to like make sure that we add a new fields into our schema to represent that as well as possible between the biological gender that they were born with and uh, sorry, the, the biological sex that they were born with and then the sort of gender that they sort of self-identify with at the moment. And that's sort of very important to add that metadata to it as well. And just as a final question to add to um, the metadata, uh, Justine Bussard um, asks, how far could we to how far could we stretch what's included in metadata? Could it include personality experiences? Would that have any value? She says it was interesting to see how the redacted photos of the of Julie's rats emphasized their personality, but that might have been anthropomorphic for her. I think you're totally right, Justine. I would agree with that. So the question is, how far could we stretch what's included in metadata? Could it include personality experiences? Would that have any value? I mean, it'd be interesting to ask a cell what it's experienced, <laughs> how it would know. I guess for for any kind of human, that metadata would have to be, could only be tagged by the person themselves. But I think it's any anything very um, subjective, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's a really great yeah, question. Yeah, linked, linked psychology, I suppose. There's all of these different, isn't there? there, there there's kind of potential crossovers and bridges into different... different I, I think it's areas. really interesting and uh, definitely the area that, that can be studied. Question with, with the current methods, can we detect these potentially very minor differences? But for example, there are studies looking at depression. So, uh, and they do find molecular differences between people. There is genetic uh, background for um, becoming more depressed or like, like there is a, how do you say, a preference for some people to have different personality traits. There is, I, I don't know much about it, but there's a theory that like you're born with personality traits. You don't get trained into your personality traits. So, I mean, it, it is some, somehow genetically coded and it could be that the small effects, they're too small to observe at the moment in the data, but having like hundreds and eventually thousands of donors, that these differences might start to show up. So it, from my perspective, as much data as you can collect, like uh, anything, your personality, are you currently happy? Are you doing any sports, etc. There we go. And I'm going to leave it at that because we've gone 15 minutes over or a lot of time. And I want to thank everybody who has stayed um, for that extended period. Thank you all so much. But a huge and warm thank you, Julie Freeman. It was fascinating to hear about your work. And thank you so much for your time. Daniel Conager, thanks again. Just wonderful to see you again and hope to see you again soon. Way and Elo, um, really brilliant session. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope you have too. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you all. Take care. Bye, thank you. Thank you everyone, bye. Bye, bye. thanks Susan, bye. thanks all, bye. bye.